Hello, I'm Brandon Jones, and this course is 18 IT 1044 Introduction to Mobile Development. This is a one credit hour course that will be offered online, although I do have an in-person course that meets on Tuesday on campus, so if you ever do want to meet me in person and go over anything, I'll be happy to schedule some to have some time with you, schedule some time upon request uh, when we can get together. So I'm going to be recording these lectures and posting them up on YouTube for you to view throughout the semester. This is a one credit hour course, but it meets for half a semester. So that means we'll meet an average of two hours per week, maybe a little bit less, maybe a little bit more depending on the week, but generally on average about two hours per week. So what I want to do today is introduce myself and then I want to learn who you are and then I want to go over the syllabus and then we'll talk a little bit about the history of mobile phones and we'll talk a little bit about different development options that are available on mobile platforms. So without further ado, let's take a look and let me tell you who I am. Usually when I have an in-person course, I, I ask students on the very first day how long I've been at UC, how long they think I've been at UC. And I've been at UC now for about 13 years. I started in the graduate program in the College of Business 13 years ago, a little more than 13 years ago, and then was hired by what was then Evening College to teach some classes for them in the 2000-2001 school year. And I've taught almost every semester, or as it were, quarter uh, since that time, including summers. I've taught almost every, every semester or quarter since then. So I started in what was then the uh, Evening College, and Evening College, which was in uh, what we used to call Sander Hall back here, that was disbanded and merged in with the College of Applied Science. That was disbanded, merged in with uh, the College of Engineering. And then Engineering and the IT program split uh, about a year or two ago. And the IT program moved to the College of, of uh, uh, Criminal Justice, Education, and Human Services. So I think I might have gotten those words out of order. But in any case, uh, that's that's where I am. I followed through all of those transitions and, and uh, been part-time uh, the whole time. I was hired initially because the university started offering Java programming. And they started offering that around 2001. So they brought me on to teach a course in JavaScript and Perl, which... Uh, in an industry where things change very frequently, Perl is a programming language that doesn't change much, which is interesting. It's kind of nice to have a little bit of stability there. JavaScript is still popular, still very popular, and if nothing else, is becoming even more popular now with the advent of something called Cordova or PhoneGap, which we'll spend a little bit of time talking about uh, in this course. So this is my website for the course. It was uh, UC Java. I have a vanity domain, ucjava.com. We'll take you right there. Uh, so it'll it'll redirect here to uh, this page. And uh, the courses I've taught, I've taught almost all the courses in the software development track. As a matter of fact, uh, many, many years ago, the only mobile offering we had was programming for Windows CE, which is a an early mobile platform uh, it was popular in its day. I, I had a Windows CE phone at one point myself. It didn't really take off when other smartphones did, though, so it kind of died. So I proposed that we rewrite that course and make it mobile programming for the BlackBerry. And it takes a good nine months to generate a course. It takes about nine months to generate a course. So by the time I had generated that course, proposed it, and we offered it, nobody wanted to learn about BlackBerry anymore. When I initially proposed the course, BlackBerry was uh, has a very dominant position in mobile. They were very much considered the top uh, smartphone, basically, in mobile. With uh, Microsoft kind of going away, Windows CE going away, and, and Apple becoming popular, with iPhone becoming popular. So uh, by the time nine months had passed, nobody wanted to talk about BlackBerry anymore. It was At that point, it was iPhone or Android. So we taught the BlackBerry course twice, and then immediately took that apart, rewrote it. And once again, I rewrote the course as Android and proposed that we change the language to Android, which we did. And so I have taught the Android development course, which is right now it's 18IT3048. 
Uh, I've taught that since it was initially offered because, frankly, I wrote it. So uh, other people teach it as well and, and do an outstanding job with it. So uh, several different options, but that's one course that I've been with for uh, quite a while. So that is my Tuesday course this semester as well. So a lot of different courses that I have taught over the years. Uh, I also wanted to stay fresh as a student, so uh, I took some courses in horticulture once I finished up my graduate degree and uh, ended up getting a degree in horticulture. So a lot of the things that I will talk about in this class will be uh, I'll use some examples from a website that I did in cooperation with DAP, uh, so a professor in DAP, who's also the director of horticulture at the Cincinnati Zoo. And so that website is Plant Places. Uh, as you see here, there is a mobile app as well. So this is the Plant Places homepage. You can do things like search, by, search plants by characteristics, like uh, plant name, genus, species, cultivar, how, how tall does it get, uh, is it native? Is it edible? Okay. Uh, does it like shade? Does it like sun? So you can search for plants like this on the full website. Okay. You can also search by color and bloom date. If you maybe want something that blooms white on May 1st, uh, you can search for that. So you'll hear a lot about this website. You'll hear quite a bit about this website uh, as we go through our course this semester. Uh, I'm going to click on here and this will talk to you a little bit about the mobile app that we have for Android okay talk a little bit about that app we'll go through that quite a bit one of the options that you see we can do with the mobile app is well here's the first screen search by color advanced search view plants by you GPS a plant view your plant collection so plants that you have GPSed help how to use, change your preferences, and then visit plantplaces.com. So one of the more popular features is the ability to take a photo, like we have here, a picture of some sweeteners. And then what it will do is it will look in that photo and it will find the top 12 colors. You can tap one of those colors and then it will show you plants that have that color at some point during the year. So we come down here and you see this is a magnolia. Probably it's a bit hard to see on the recording, but the magnolia is kind of like the pink sweetener packet picture that we took. Okay, and you see here's another one. Uh, here's some more colors, some more flowers with that kind of pink uh, sweetener color inside. So uh, that's an app that we'll spend some time talking about. Now, uh, this is not a programming course, so we're not going to get too deep in programming details, but we will consider things like UI. What is a good user interface? And I have to admit that this app has some places where it could be improved. I don't doubt that. The app is functional. It's not pretty. So we'll talk about things like how to make an app pretty. So, uh, Night Professor here. A couple other things I do. I was hired recently by Northwestern University to assist with their mobile program, their mobile certificate program, uh, which I was very excited about. That's a highly ranked school in uh, Chicago. And so they have a certificate program very similar to ours uh, at UC. I thought there might be some excellent opportunities to collaborate with them, uh, which I am. So uh, working both at UC and at Northwestern University doing very much the same thing. Uh, in my spare time, I have a full-time job working uh, in point of sale. So I uh, write software for point of sale systems for a company with a global headquarters in England and North American headquarters in Springdale. So uh, that's my full-time job. I don't have much spare time, given all that. I don't have much spare time to catch up on Survivor, so I don't tend to watch much TV. So uh, that's who I am. I asked you to fill out a survey telling me a little bit about who you are, and uh, let's take a look at that. Let's go over that. I saw some uh, pretty nice answers. The first thing I want to do is make sure that this course is valuable to you. I don't want to waste your time or mine. So questions I have for you are, what do you want to learn? Okay, how to develop apps on the mobile platform to potentially make money in my free time as an app developer. Okay, uh, definitely a good goal. One note I will say is that we're not going to be doing any development in this course. At least there won't be any assignments. You'll probably see me doing some development. 
Um, but you won't be required to do any hard development in this course. After you take this course, you should be pretty well prepared to decide what you want to take next. Do you want to take mobile web, which is kind of a platform independent approach? Do you want to take uh, more Android programming? Do you want to take iPhone? Which way do you want to go? And a lot of the things that we're going to cover in this class will be important for the other classes that you will take. So things like storyboarding. I said, we'll go over this when we go through the syllabus. Things like storyboarding, quality details, deployment, and the like. We're going to go over some very important concepts. So this is a course you definitely want to take before going on to other courses. But we won't do a whole lot of hands-on programming in this course. OK. I'd like to have an understanding of the foundations of mobile applications, how they are created, why, and what are the various methods. Okay, sounds good to me. We'll definitely touch on that. I want to learn the basics about developing mobile apps. Eventually, my roommate and I plan to make applications for mobile devices on the regular. On the regular. Okay, maybe that's a phrase I don't know or a sentence that ended a little bit prematurely. In any case, a lot of interest in doing mobile apps, obviously, which is why you're here. Uh, and there's a lot of demand for mobile app developers as well. So this is a good course to be in. Okay, more about the mobile development, basics about mobile devices. Again, that's great. We'll cover those. I would like to get an overview of the mobile development lifecycle. I would really appreciate a look at cross-platform development. Okay, we'll touch on both of those. I want to learn the fundamentals of mobile app design and gain a better understanding of mobile development. Okay, all sounds good. Okay, what experience do you have? And I stress, because we're not a programming course, uh, you don't have to have programming experience. So I have no experience whatsoever. Okay, don't feel intimidated. You don't need any ex experience. Okay, next, C Sharp, iOS, Objective-C, C++, HTML. So this sounds like somebody with uh, some Microsoft experience and especially some Apple experience. Okay, very little. Okay, no problem. Uh, basic iPhone development course I'm currently taking. Okay, uh, MATLAB and C++ and a little Python. Sounds good. Okay, working as a developer analyst, C Sharp and ASP.NET. Uh, currently working on learning developing skills on Apple and Windows mobile platforms. So a nice diverse set of experience that we have here. Also diverse set of majors, CSST, Graphic Communication Design, Aerospace Engineering, Anthropology, and so on. Sounds like a lot of things, uh, a, a lot of good experience for us to communicate with, other, with each other. A lot of experience for us to kind of uh, share with each other. Okay, if you have a smartphone, what is your favorite app? Map My Run, that's always, I've heard that one before, popular. Instagram, Weather, Movie Phone, Any Do for the iPhone, not, okay, haven't heard of that one before. Uh, Zeit, I love to read news and have it broken down by subjects. That, that sounds pretty cool. I have found, I use my mobile device to read news a lot, and I found that a lot of the sources I use now get kind of annoying because they put pop-up ads that I can't dismiss. Okay, Facebook. And Adobe, I'm going to guess that's uh, cooler or cooler. I don't know. I haven't used that before. Okay, next. This is an interesting question. And again, I wish I would have taken this question uh, over a series of time and watched how it evolved because the answers here are pretty interesting. Uh, do you own or have access to any of these platforms? Choose all that apply. Now, this grades is a question, so it, you know, ignore the percent correct and the percent incorrect. The percent incorrect means means what percentage of people in class own or have access to that phone. So actually, the far right column is the only one you want to pay attention to. A little better than 57% uh, own or have access to Android, 0% BlackBerry. That really shows you how that's kind of fallen from grace lately. Uh, years ago, it would have been a number greater than zero, I'll tell you that. 71.42% an iPhone, 42% uh, a Windows phone. That one kind of threw me off. The, uh, the Windows phone is picking up in popularity. Um, but I'm surprised that many people have access to one. But okay, uh, you know. For me, I, I like that. I'm, I'm happy to see uh, a lot of competition and different players in the market because that tends to breed uh, good ideas. Old school phone, 
uh, 28%, and then uh, cannot access a phone, 0%. So that's good. That gives us some, that gives us what we need to do our assignments this semester. As long as you can access a mobile phone, uh, you'll have what you need to do your assignments. Okay, so uh, now I've had a chance to introduce myself, and I've also had a chance to learn a little bit about you. So next, let's take a look at the syllabus and the projects that we have due this semester. Okay, the syllabus, as we know, it's IT1044C, and most of the people taking this course are not uh, not in major, not software development in major. So there's a a great diversity of the people in this course, which I'm very excited about. So uh, to begin with office hours, since we are online, I'm happy to meet you virtually if, if you prefer, or uh, we can meet in person on campus, uh, hope, uh, preferably on Tuesday when I have my other course. So how does this course fit into the sequence? From one stop, uh, the class this class introduces the basics of software development for mobile devices. It covers a survey of the current and future markets, characteristics of mobile devices, the development lifecycle, and the various mobile app marketplaces. Hands-on active learning is required. Okay, so the things we're going to be going over, and we'll look at this in our schedule, history of mobile devices, types of mobile devices, limitations and benefits, types of operating systems, the difference between open architecture and closed architecture. The examples here are uh, Android and Apple, but that's not necessarily set in stone with, with things like uh, Cordova or PhoneGap, which is platform independent development. We could even kind of segment this into uh, more different categories. So Cordova versus Android versus Apple. Okay, explain the life cycle of mobile apps and explain user interface considerations. Okay, uh, what we have here is uh, evaluation of uh, weekly quizzes and quiz question suggestions is 20%, final exam 20%. Uh, I'd like you to storyboard an application that you know you would like to put together. You don't necessarily have to write the application, but maybe if you have one in mind, consider how to storyboard it. And then a research project, which is not terribly daunting. I will have these posted on Blackboard soon. They're not up yet. This is the first time that this course has been delivered. It's the first time we've ever offered this course. So, uh, you know, there's a little bit of a few things that need to gel before uh, everything's set in stone. But uh, this is pretty close to what we'll have. I'd like to have a bit of time for peer review as well. So uh, I, I may take this 40% and cut it into half and make uh, half of it a peer review of somebody else's storyboard or somebody else's research project. So I said, more on that to come. Let's take a look at these one by one. First of all, the weekly quizzes. I mentioned that I took a course from uh, I, I took a course in horticulture and eventually got a degree in horticulture, which would be my third degree. And it's kind of funny how I started that program. I started that program when I got hired as, as a professor uh, because I wanted to take notes on how good teachers teach. I wanted to learn how to be a teacher, and I decided one way to do that was to be a student, but not be a student who just studies the material. I wanted to be a student who studies the teaching methods as well. So I took a course from Tom Smith, who's been teaching horticulture for 42 years. Uh, that was, you know, a while ago. Actually, it's been a little bit longer than that he's been teaching. I believe he just retired. I don't know if he's still teaching in the uh, uh, in DAP, but I believe he just retired. And one of the things that I noticed in horticulture is that we had to learn 16 plant. 16 plants per week, and that meant common name, Latin name, uh, bloom time, height, uh, water, uh, does, does it like wet feet, uh, is it drought tolerant, things like that. Had to learn all of these for 16 plants, and we couldn't make any spelling errors. And I can't, I, I, I can't remember things in the short term. I can remember long term. I can't remember short term. And I really struggled with this until he told me the secret. And the secret is, when you learn something for the first time, take a few moments and just rehearse what you've learned just once. Just go over your notes one time, and you'll find 
that you're able to retain memory much, much better. So I tried it. At that time, I took the bus, and usually I took the bus up to UC. Uh, usually I would go over my notes on the bus. And I, you have to do it within 24 hours, though. That's the important thing. You have to do it within 24 hours. So what we have on Blackboard, uh, I'm going to go back to Blackboard, and I'm going to go to Assignments. After you finish watching the videos for a given week, okay, take a second to refresh here. After you finish watching the videos for a given week, there will be a quiz question suggestions. And you see this link is live right now. I'm going to go ahead and choose Begin. And what this is, is put yourself in my shoes. If you were teaching this course, what would you put on a quiz for next week? So think of the material that we cover one night. If you were teaching the course, what would you put on the quiz next week? Okay, that's what I'd like you to fill out. So this is an opportunity for you to go over your notes, do it within 24 hours of watching the lecture. Go over your notes, make some notes to yourselves, about, gosh, you know, that would be a good quiz question. And, and I would like you to suggest three of those. Okay, each week suggest three. Now, if you suggest three, or when you suggest three, what I'll do is I'll take everybody's suggestions, put them in a document, and I'll email them back to everybody who completed this exercise. And then I'm going to make a weekly quiz, and guess what? The quiz will mostly come from those quiz question suggestions. If there's an important topic that wasn't captured in a quiz question suggestion, you know, I might go ahead and throw in a few questions of my own. But that's the idea. That's the idea is I would like you to uh, have a chance to rehearse the material that you learned within 24 hours, post quiz question suggestions, then I'll give you a list of everybody's quiz question suggestions, and, um, and, and then we'll, I'll use those to make the quiz the next week. Okay. Additionally, this is a pre-recorded course, but I don't want you to feel like you're on your own, like you're in an island or anything like that. So uh, question number four, are there any questions that you have for me? Okay, is there anything from this course that was unclear? And when I do quiz question suggestions, I'll look for these and then I'll respond to you with an answer. Of course, you're all, always welcome to contact me by email as well or any other way that, that's appropriate. Uh, but uh, this is an opportunity for you to almost anonymously ask. I mean, your name is on there, but I'm going to look at them in bulk. So this is an opportunity for you to interact with me and say, hey, this wasn't clear, or gosh, I'd like to know more about this, or maybe even I disagree with what you said. Okay, this is a, an opportunity for you to give me some feedback. So this is due at 6 o'clock every Friday. There will be one of these every week. This is due at 6. It's very important this is turned in at 6 because I don't give uh, I don't give extensions or penalty waivers or extra credit. It must be turned in by 6 on Friday. And the reason is uh, I'm going to do most of these recordings on uh, Sunday night or Monday night this semester. And that means I need to grade the quizzes before I do the recording to make sure that uh, to, you know, to make sure that I delivered material appropriately. So that leaves me a very small window to actually come up with a quiz. That window is basically Friday night, Saturday, and part of Sunday. So it's very important that these are turned in by 6. I cannot take anything after 6 o'clock. So that's the quiz question suggestion. And then at the beginning of the week, each week, we'll also have a quiz. And that quiz will track the material the quiz will cover the material from the previous week, okay? Uh, the quizzes, I'll typically make those due probably Monday, Monday night. Uh, I will put, you know, I'll send out a notice when they're available. But again, ideally, I would really like to have those quizzes in my hand uh, before I start recording the lecture because that'll give me an opportunity to go over the quiz answers. So quizzes and quiz question suggestions. Uh, big lesson here, while this is a recorded online class, don't plan to wait until the end of the semester and watch all the recordings at once, because by that time, the quizzes will have been already done and graded, and there's nothing else we can do. Okay, final exam, of course, at the end of the semester. Story, and, and oh, uh, all quizzes and exams will be on Blackboard. Uh, storyboard, this is pretty neat. 
one moment let me grab the storyboard uh storyboard is a time when we're going to think about what our app will look like and there is a website called fluid ui let me show you this url fluid ui this is what i'm going to use uh, you're welcome to use maybe powerpoint or html if you want but uh this fluid ui gives us an opportunity sorry i know it screen's a little bit small here gives us an opportunity to mock up what our mobile app will look like and also how screens will talk to each other let me see if i can zoom out on this guy uh, okay and so what we can do whoops let me zoom out again we can make connections between screens we can show a flow from screen to screen we'll go over this later in the semester but fluid ui gives us an opportunity to kind of put together our mobile screens by putting different UI components or widgets if you prefer, or views, whatever you prefer, buttons, text boxes, things like that, and show the flow from screen to screen. So don't underestimate this. Don't underestimate the importance of this. That was one thing I struggled with a bit with my own app is how do the screens go together? What's the flow? think to yourself uh, everybody said they have a smart device of some kind so think to yourself uh, when do you use your smart device when do you use your smart device many times we're going to use our smart device at a time when we need to minimize our typing we need to minimize our interaction we don't want a very convoluted look and feel. We don't want something that's going to make us dig. We want something that's gonna have a fairly simple interface, but it's going to help us try to predict where we want to go next. It's not gonna require a lot of typing. Maybe it will remember some of our habits and uh, take our favorite screen and put it up front. We don't want the user to have to navigate several screens deep because Many times when we're using our mobile phone, honestly, we're a little bit distracted with other things. So we need it to be very simple and easy. We really need to stress that. We don't want to overload the user with information. Uh, okay, what is the first screen we want to show to the user? Uh, if there is a screen that maybe we access 90% of the time, do we want to just default to that and allow the users to opt out of that screen and go to a different screen? These are important considerations, and, and for my own application, these are things that really kind of uh, required a bit of thought and, and even had me delay when I went live because I wasn't sure how I wanted to handle that. Uh, so that's, that's what our storyboard will be. Next, we have an application research project. Uh, don't read too much into this. this the, you know, what, the, uh, what, what we'll do with this is we're going to look at the quality guidelines from iOS from, from Apple and from Google and any others that we can find. And we're going to try to find apps that do not meet those quality guidelines. I said, this is easier than it sounds, to be honest with you. All you have to do is look for an app with a low rating. Odds are it misses the quality guidelines. When I took my application live, Plant Places for Android, when I took that live, in February, I went through the Google quality checklist and I waited until the end to read that checklist. Don't do that. <laughs> read it in the beginning because I didn't realize until the end there was there were several bare minimum requirements that I was not doing. Things like uh, using threads appropriately, which is important orientation changes if you take the phone and you turn it you, know, you turn the orientation uh, how that should react uh, back button usage and so on and so forth uh, I, as it were I really wanted to get my app out on a certain day it was February 3rd I the, the app is used mostly by the horticulture industry and that tends to be a slow time naturally because it is winter and snowy days people tend to be inside looking for something to do uh, Sundays. Sunday is the most watched night of television, where Friday is the least. Sunday is when people are a little worn out from the weekend. They're ready to unwind a little bit. And so I figured a snowy Sunday in February, right before spring starts, would be perfect. February 3rd was a snowy Sunday in February. So I went ahead and released it after I did a, a quality check on everything. 
that was a really good learning experience and one that we're going to see together. We're going to look at quality guidelines in this course. What what does uh, the Apple Store and the Google Play Store, what do they require? So that was a good learning process. One thing I found is after I knew the requirements, when I saw apps that didn't abide by the requirements, it was very frustrating. Uh, I got an app for Titan TV, even though I don't watch TV much. Uh, I got an app for Titan TV. I guess I shouldn't say their name, but oh well, it's too late. I could go back and edit that out, but just pretend you didn't hear it. I got an app for Titan TV that will show the local listings in my area. Great app, great idea. Unfortunately, there's no way to close it. This app's been downloaded maybe 10 or 100,000 times, and there is no way to close it. There's no close button. You cannot hit on the back button to close it. It's been overridden. That is an absolute no-no in the Google Play Store. You cannot disable the back button. You also cannot make your own back button that does the same thing as the back button on the phone. So uh, those are things that, that have gotten to annoy me um, is I see other apps that miss the quality guidelines. So what we're going to do with our research project We'll look for apps that do meet the guidelines, and we'll look for apps that don't meet the guidelines. So uh, that's all. I mean, it's going to be fun. This isn't. It's not going to be write a 20-page paper, nothing like that. It's purely going to be some self-research. Okay? Uh, delivery, as you know, the delivery of these lectures will be online on YouTube. I've, as I said, I've taught a lot of other classes, and so I have put a lot of my other lectures on YouTube. I noticed that YouTube does some scaling that makes it kind of hard to see things in, in good resolution. So I'm trying a different size this time. I'm trying a bit smaller screen capture than I usually have. I think this is a 640 by 480. Incredibly, that's how big our monitors used to be. It's hard to believe now, but that's how big they used to be. Uh, so uh, I'm trying a, a bit of a different size. We'll see if this works out better. Not sure. Maybe it will. Maybe it won't. Uh, grading is typical scale, nothing special there. Attendance, of course, is unique here because we are online. All I'll say is that you are expected to view the videos, do the quiz question suggestions, and do the in-class quiz. And again, a warning, which is that there are no extensions or uh, extra credit or penalty waivers. So when something is due, it is an absolute hard deadline. It is definitely due. We've talked about lab time uh, in-class quiz and quiz question suggestions. Go ahead and uh, go over those. Uh, checkpoint exam. And uh, checkpoint exam will be the final exam towards the end of the semester. Assignments. Again, I just spoke about those. We'll skip over those. Academic integrity. We have to set a line somewhere. I, I take cheating very seriously. Uh, people have asked me before, do I enjoy failing students? And the answer to that question is absolutely no. I want every student to do very well in this class, and it's my goal to make sure that every student is doing very well. Uh, I take no joy in failing a student, and I think universally almost every professor you talk to will give you that same answer. There is no personal joy or satisfaction in failing a student. The joy and satisfaction that I get is seeing students do well and then working with them after they've graduated. My current employer has hired four of my former students and all have performed very well. That's what I take joy in. I will admit I do take joy in catching academic integrity because that means that someone's playing a game with me and I have won. So I take that very seriously. I take academic integrity uh, very seriously. So uh, we have to draw a line somewhere. Uh, what is the line? Well, uh, you're always welcome to verbally help somebody else. You're always welcome to verbally coach, but you can't do any electronic duplication. That means any part of any assignment, you cannot make a copy of it and give it to a fellow student. Uh, e email or instant message, doesn't matter how big or small, no electric duplication. I'll tell you from experience, what typically happens in this case is that there's a very good student and then a student who is not keeping up. And the student who's not keeping up will go to the very good student and say, hey, I'm a little behind. Can I borrow your project and just use it as a guideline 
Uh, I'll do my own work, but I just want to compare it to yours and make sure I'm on the right track. And that sounds innocent. It's like, well, I'm not actually going to copy it. I'm just going to use it as a guideline. That's how it always happens. It sounds very innocent. Uh, what always happens next is the student who's underprepared will take your work, because you who I'm talking to right now, you're, of course, going to be the good student. The student who's underprepared will take your work, put his or her name on it, and then submit it as his own. Okay, so uh, be careful. Don't do that. Uh, now, I treat that as I do drug dealers. We have to take care of both the source and the destination. So if I get two identical programs with two different names on it, I consider both academic dishonesty, both the person who did the original work and the person who copied it. So just be aware, if someone asks you for your work, okay, you're putting yourself at risk unless you say no, okay? Electronic communications policy. This one normally goes without saying. Honestly, this has only been a problem one time. Uh, and uh, a, a problem where I think somebody was using a lack of electronic communications to try to uh, find and uh, get a better grade. But um, this is an online course. I'm assuming that you have access to the internet to watch these videos. Also, you must have access to Blackboard. That means you must be able to use Blackboard without assistance. So um, you, uh, if a project is due on Blackboard, you can't say, oh, I turned it in late because I couldn't get into Blackboard. That's something for you to work out and you to work out with Blackboard support if needed. Okay. Special needs, of course, I'm always happy to assist anyone who has special needs from the Office of Disability Services. That usually requires an in-person signature. So if you do have any special needs, uh, please let me know in advance. I'll be happy to uh, sign this. We can meet up ahead of time if we need uh, in my Tuesday class and, and take care of that as needed. Okay, uh, resource and instructional, instructional materials. Uh, no books required for this course. I'll point out web resources as needed. Probably one of the biggest resources is going to be the recorded lectures, uh, but things like the uh, things like the Fluid UI, uh, that's something that we'll use, and you know uh, the Play Store, uh, the quality guidelines, things like that. So our weekly schedule, okay, this week, of course, doing introductions, history of mobile devices, types of mobile devices. Next week, development options, development considerations. Week three, storyboarding, user interface design, user interface components. Week four, we'll continue with UI design, uh, application layers and reusability, quality guidelines. That's kind of fun. I, I enjoy the user interface design. What are good UI tips? Week five, quality guidelines, deploying your app, what to do after deployment, making money. Week six, I believe that they actually count week six as a lecture week plus exam week. Uh, we have to do both, but um, we'll see how it goes. We might have a recorded lecture that week or we might just have the exam. We'll see how our time goes uh, this semester. Going to be a fun course. I'm looking forward to it. Next, some service level agreements. I'll go over these kind of at a high level. Uh, you can read them a bit deeper if you want. It's just a set of expectations between you and me. In our industry of information technology, we tend to have a lot of times specialized skill sets. So many times you can go to a company that makes, say, brownies and say, you're good at making brownies. Maybe you're not good at running an IT system. So instead of trying to do it all on your own, how about you farm the work out to me uh, and I will do the IT work for you? That's fairly common. A lot of companies have found that IT just changes too quickly and, and they have trouble keeping up with it. It's easier to farm that out. So what we'll usually have then is a service level agreement, which means I agree to provide this level of service to you uh, as a contractual agreement. And so that's what I have for you, both service levels I provide to you and service levels I ask back from you in return. First of all, for questions, uh, I guarantee I'll respond to all questions within 48 hours. If I don't, uh, send me a reminder. And the time between when you send me that reminder and when I actually answer the question, you get that time back as an extension on a project. Uh, in reality, that's 
rarely ever happen. I don't think anyone's ever had to call me on the 48 hour guarantee. Occasionally I'll get an email and I'll think, oh yeah, I'll respond to this a little bit later and I'll forget. That does happen, but usually I do respond pretty quickly. Um, now, questions that I can answer are usually ones that are well rehearsed, well informed questions. Uh, ones that uh, maybe have a screen capture or tell me what a, an issue is. There are some questions that I cannot answer within 48 hours, and so they're exempt from the 48-hour guarantee. Uh, I'm lost. I don't know where to begin. That one's just vague. It doesn't give me any details or any way that I can help. Uh, what I need is a more specific question that tells me what is confusing. I'm getting an error. Uh, again, without any more details than that, just I'm getting an error. It's okay if you're getting an error, but give me some details that I can look at. The first two typically come from students who are falling behind or underprepared. The last question actually comes from the A students, and that is, can you look at my project and let me know what you think? I exempt this from the 48-hour guarantee just because usually I get this question um, when projects are due. And what this is asking is, can you grade my project so that if I don't get an A, I can do it again? Uh, usually at that point when we're coming up on the deadline, I'm usually, my hands are pretty full with grading other projects. So I just can't give that a quick response. Okay. For all on-time projects, I guarantee I'll have grades back to you within seven days. Uh, in reality, I really try for three days, but seven days is my guarantee. For projects that are turned in late, I save them till the end of the semester and grade them all at once because it takes time to just get set up to grade. Uh, things like looking at academic dishonesty, getting environment set up, looking at grading criteria, that takes time. So uh, that's something that, that I can't guarantee a turnaround on. Uh, okay, lab time and office hours, we talked about that, just set them up with me. Um, if, it is, if it is the week that assignment is due, I do request an appointment with 24 hours notice. Okay. Um, this is the important paragraph. Uh, everybody has outside considerations. I worked my way through school, lived with my parents and all that, and so I'm no stranger to this. I know everybody has outside considerations. There's only one way to deal with that fairly, and that is to hold everybody to the same high standard. So usually about twice per class, somebody will ask me for an extension uh, because of extenuating cir circumstances. I really don't care what the circumstances are. I always respond the same way to all students, which is everybody is graded in a fair and equitable manner and everyone is held to the same high, same high standards. I can't grant you an extension or penalty waiver. When I get that email, I typically take this paragraph, just copy and paste it into the he email and hit reply, reply and send. So um, the only exceptions are anything that's pre pre-authorized with the Office of Disability Services and any religious holidays uh, when I'm notified in advance. Okay, we talked about quizzes and quiz question suggestions. So that's me, you, and that's our syllabus. Uh, I think that's all we want to talk about for this first recording. I keep the recordings uh, at about 45 minutes each just to make sure I don't overload uh, YouTube or my recording software. So I'm going to go ahead and save this off. And in our next recording, we're going to talk about the history of mobile phones, and we're going to talk about some considerations in developing for the mobile platform. So we'll save this off, and we'll see you again in part two. Thank you.